Mr. P, how about uh, you tell us a little bit about how you grew up, where you grew up at? Okay, well, I'm originally from Ma Massachusetts, the western end of the state, the, what is called the Berkshires, up in the mountains. Uh, grew up in the late 50s uh, through the 60s up there and um, lived there until after I uh, came back from the service and finished school. Had any family there, brothers, um, sisters? No one right in that area. My sister and my mom still live in uh, Albany, near Albany, New York. Okay. Um, what kind of jobs did you have while you were there growing up? Well, I had a lot of jobs. Um, always working, had a paper route. Uh, at the time, you could collect uh, bottles and turn them in for deposits. Uh, mowed lawns. I mowed lawns and was kind of a, a little handyman right through high school. In fact, when I went to uh, boot camp, my dad and my brother had to take over the business because I still had customers I had to take care of. So. Um, always working, um, probably more jobs than most people have had. I seem, seem to go from job to job and, and get bored with one job and on to the next. Understandable. Um, so how did you uh, eventually get into uh, serving our country? Well, I was a senior in high school and actually uh, was skipping for the day. <laughs> and uh, the plumber who had come to make a call at the house um, saw me walking around and said, uh, you know, what are you doing? And I said, well, I didn't feel like going to school today. He said, what are you going to do after school? I said, I don't know, get a job and, you know, whatever. And he says, why don't you come up and join, uh, look into the CBs, um, up, at, up at, the, at that time they had a reserve unit, and uh, learn a trade. I said, well, maybe that's not a bad idea. So I went up and that's how I got into the uh, CBs through the reserves. Okay, so where did they uh, send you off first? Well, first we went to uh, Davisville, Rhode Island. Um, at the time, um, that's when um, that was the summer of '64. So I don't think I knew about Vietnam at the time. I don't think two people, many people, did. And I went to boot camp there. And because I was in the reserves, I came back um, and, and actually went to a community college for a semester or two. And uh, after a semester, the dean of students said, I don't think you're college material. So I, I went to work, I actually worked at General Electric, driving a fork truck and, and whatnot, and uh, thought uh, maybe I could uh, keep delaying going in, because by then, Vietnam was building up, and not that I didn't want to go, but I'd you know, see how long I can make this last. Um, finally got called up and went active in October of 66. Okay, so um, can you clarify a little bit of what CBs are? Yeah, a lot of people don't know much about them. Um, they're the construction battalion of the U.S. Navy. Um, they were formed during World War II. Uh, there was a movie, John Wayne and the Fighting Seabees. Uh, if anybody's seen that, probably not. Uh, but um, the Navy realized that as they were going into the islands in the Pacific, they needed uh, some people with construction ability, but also with military experience to go in and build up the islands, uh, repair airfields, uh, build barracks, uh, roads, whatever needed to be done. And so they started to uh, bring in the Seabees. Uh, we're, we're, in most cases, experienced construction men. Most of us, and it was true in Vietnam too, um, were older than the average uh, recruit. I was 20 when I went in and I had some construction experience. Others uh, with a lot of construction experience come in as uh, well, let's see, an E-4, an E-5, which would be uh, like a, maybe a corporal or, or a sergeant. Um, they could skip over a couple of grades because they had some experience who were older. So then we were basically a large construction company, uh, plumbers to equipment operators to, you know, uh, electricians and engineers. Okay, so um, when did you finally uh, get the go to actually uh, go to Vietnam? When did the orders come in mm -hmm. for uh, you shipping out? Um, I went over in uh, January 2nd, 1968. Uh, we land, flew out of Davisville, Rhode Island to uh, Elm, uh, Alaska and uh, Japan and then finally into Da Nang. Uh, so we got there, um, I, I, I think it was the 4th or the 5th of January. And uh, they trucked us out to a little base outside of Da Nang and I uh, got there just in time for, to celebrate uh, Tet 68 with uh, a lot of people. It was a pretty exciting time over there then, if you know your history. Mm -hmm. 
Um, when you were first going in, were you nervous at all? Or? Oh, sure. Yeah, we all were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, so what happened after that? Um, did you start working, building new uh, facilities there for the Army? Or Navy? Um, yeah, we, well, we built for whoever mm -hmm. needed uh, things done. Um, no, the first um, four months or so I was on security. So we ran patrols, did perimeter, um, you know, stuff like that. Ran the guardhouse and uh, stuff like that. So made sure people coming in and out of the camp were who they were supposed to be. Um, so that's what I did in the beginning. After that, um, I was assigned to a work crew, and we went around to various places in the I Corps. I Corps was just a, they divided the country up into different corps. I'm sure it's not I Corps now, it's something else, but. Uh, uh, at the time, that was uh, considered I Corps around the Da Nang area. Okay. Um, while you were there, how much contact did you have with back home as, of course, protests and um, yeah. a lot of that was going on in our country? Not, well, not like it is today because we didn't have the access. To the, there was no Internet. There was no computers. Once a, a, a week on a Sunday afternoon, you could go down to what they call the Mars station. I'm not sure what Mars stands for, but it was a radio communication that um, and we could call of course the uh, the time frame was quite different so when it was noontime over there it was early morning here um, I never did that I, I went a couple of times but the line was so long that uh, uh, th by the time I got close to it it was they were over they were done for that time so I never did that uh, but we wrote letters I, I got letters from my girlfriend who became my wife uh, almost every day and my mother and father, my brothers, when, you know, so there was the old snail mail, you know, the daily mail call like you probably see, you know, where they stand up and call your name and give you your letters and stuff like that. So that's how we maintain contact. As far as what was going on in terms of protest, um, we knew there was some stuff going on. We didn't, they didn't keep that from us. Um, but again, communication isn't like it is today. If something happened here, Today, we wouldn't know about it until maybe a week later. Uh, we could go down. We were um, not far from a fairly large uh, field hospital there. And they, there was a PX, um, uh, like a store. And we were also not far from China Beach, which we could go there on Sundays if we had a chance to get a ride up there. China Beach was like a, a small R&R &R center, a beautiful beach, beautiful surf, and uh, places to eat and um, places to buy things. So we could get magazines and newspapers there. Okay. Um, did you? How did your uh, relationships with people there? How did they progress? Um, you develop very good friends that probably last till today, or? Um, yeah, to, to some. Well, at, I, I mean, the neat thing about the way we were trained, as opposed to, and I, I wasn't in the army, so I, but I, I, from what I hear the guys talk about. A lot of times they would be sent over there and serve as a replacement in a company, and they didn't know anybody. Uh, we, uh, because we were, there was so much um, increase in military, and uh, the CBs formed as a battalion, we trained for about eight, nine months before we went over. So we all went over together, pretty much. So we had developed pretty good relationships by then. Um, and um, some of them continued for a few years afterwards. I had a friend. Uh, my best friend over there uh, passed away a couple of years ago, and he's the probably the only one I really had any contact with over the year, over those years. And it's been been a long time. Okay, were there uh, any memorable moment, moments uh, during your service? Something that might have been funny, something might have been tragic. Hmm. Well, I don't know about uh, funny, but uh, probably kind of tragic to some degree. Um, because I was on security, uh, part of my job was to maintain the, the front gate, and there were some Vietnamese that came and um, would sell things at the front gate. Jewelry, um, uh, this one was an excellent seamstress, and I bought uh, some of the Vietnamese uh, gowns, uh, the long dresses with the slits that um, you probably see that they were, war were fashionable there. They wore a pair of silk pants underneath it. And um, got to know them uh, to the degree that they invited us to their house on Sunday and had a, had a nice meal with them and, and everything. And um, 
I don't know, you know, after we left what happened to them. So I always kind of thought, think about them. Most of the people there just wanted to live their lives. They wanted to be left alone and, and, and allowed to live uh, their lives. They were very fearful of what would happen when we left and uh, when the communists came in, um, as they all were. You know, they would go back and forth in terms of the, the villagers farther out would see um, us there, the, the United States, and and things were fairly settled, but as soon as we left, back would come the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese and terrorize them and uh, terrible, terrible atrocities that these people went through. Um, so that was kind of the, the sad thing. There wasn't anything, um, uh, well, I'll give you a funny uh, episode. Uh, after, after the security, I was put on the, the work crew, and then after a while, I was uh, assigned to the supply depot. Just like any construction job, you, before you go out in the morning, you get, went and got your plywood or you got in your, your rebar or whatever. And so that was one of my functions. Uh, for some reason, I ended up driving a fork truck again, loading up trucks and whatnot. But uh, we also did a lot of trading. There were things that we needed that we couldn't get through the usual channels. If you ever saw MASH and radar always manipulating and doing deals, kind of like that. And for some reason, I didn't do it, but someone made... A, uh, a trade for some kosher Passover food, sea rations, believe it or not, that were, that were kosher. And uh, nobody really wanted them. <laughs> uh, nothing, I have some very good Jewish friends, so uh, <laughs> nothing against the Jewish religion, but uh, they just sat there. So s somehow um, we kind of tricked uh, some army guys, that, and um, they wanted some of our equipment. And uh, we said, well, we'll throw in all these uh, rations here for you, too. So um, we traded, and they got the uh, sea rations, the kosher sea rations. I don't know whatever happened to them, but uh, <laughs> they sat for quite a while before we could finally trade them. Okay, so um, how were your feelings? How, how was things going over there as the war started to end? Things were starting to wind down, and eventually. Well, it was still 68. Was still, we were at the peak of the war. There were about half a million Americans there, and it was there was a lot of stuff going on. I mean, we were constantly under, um, uh, especially the first uh, during the Tet Offensive, and for several months after that, uh, we were uh, subject to mortar and rocket attack uh, frequently. Uh, I think the first, the worst one was we had about 15 wounded. As far as I know, we never lost anybody. Um, you know, we had uh, stuff happen, but we weren't in the search and destroy. We weren't going out on, on missions. We run our little patrols around the perimeter. We had some Marines that in camp that also maintained some security for us. We worked with the Marines closely, trained with the Marines down in June, um, did a lot of work with the Marines. And uh, so most of it were mortar and rocket attacks. Um, there was a large Marine amphibious group across the road from us that they were constantly trying to hit because they had large uh, fuel depots and storages and every once in a while they hit a rocket into one of these huge storage depots and, and all the flames and everything. Um, so it was, uh, there was a lot of activity, a lot of stuff going on. Some of the guys were up at um, and some of the outposts where there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, so um, Quezon, which was one, one place that held out for a long, long time, the Marines held out a long time there. Uh, some of our guys were up there. Um, so, you know, there was, it, was, it was a pretty active time. Okay, so um, the end of the war comes about, and um, mm -hmm. how did you feel when you first heard the news that you'd be coming back home? Oh, we were glad, you know, mm -hmm. if you're, you're going to go into the academy and, you, you know, you get all these rumors about, well, we're coming back this date, or oh, we're coming about that date. No, we're going to be shipping out earlier, later, whatever. Um, Fortunately, I thought that because I was the first one over because we were um, in the security that we had to go over and secure the area and take it over from the, 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 the CBs that were there before um, that I would be one of the first ones to go back, but I actually ended up being one of the last ones to go back. Uh, but anyways, um, yeah, we were thrilled to go back home. I mean, that's all we thought about, all we, uh, you know, and the, you, you had a uh, calendar, short timers calendar where you checked off the days. So we knew, you know, the days and we didn't know exact days, but you know, we knew we were getting close. Um, we knew our time over there was going to be a certain period of time, certain number of months. We just didn't know exactly, maybe nine months, maybe 10 months, maybe, you know, we'll come back in mid-September, maybe it'll be the first of October, but we knew um, that there was a definite end to it. 
unlike World War II, uh, my dad joined when he was 17 and, uh, you know, didn't come home until the war was over. So a little different. Okay. So how was it when you first got home, being back in America? Oh, it was great. You know, I was glad to be home and um, uh, got married shortly after that. And, uh, you know, so, um, and we were, there's a lot of, and if I may, I, I have a poem that I wrote that, I, you know, that maybe I can wrap up with. But um, for us, uh, for my experience, it wasn't a bad experience. Um, got a call from uh, the uh, city hall uh, where I was still living in Pittsfield at the time, Pittsfield, Massachusetts. They invited me to the city hall, and there was a number of other veterans there, and they gave us a, a certificate of appreciation and a check for $250. So I thought that was pretty cool. You know, that was nice. Um, the... Um, state of Massachusetts um, gave free state tuition uh, to any of the state colleges for uh, Vietnam veterans. And it was only one time we transferred up to uh, what is now called North Adam Adams uh, Liberal College. I don't know why they, where the liberal comes from it, but anyways. Um, it was at that time a teacher's college, and I was going to be a teacher. I wanted to go to... So we transferred up there, and uh, the uh, registrar wouldn't recognize our free tuition. So we staged a, a very quiet protest in his office and almost threw him out the window. And uh, the dean of students came and said, you know, they, these guys are entitled to the free tuition. There's, because he was forcing guys to make, uh, take out loans right then and there for their tuition and stuff like that. So um, that was the only kind of, uh, after that we, we organized ourselves because we felt we had a need to, and um, we didn't have too much trouble at, at the schools. Uh, we were older, and um, I guess we weren't going to tolerate too much foolishness from anybody at that, at that point in time. But there's, there was a lot. Uh, a lot of the guys did go through an awful lot of bad stuff when they, they came back to the States and going through the airports and stuff like that. There was a lot of animosity, and there still is a, a stereotype uh, that uh, most of us are drug crazed or were, were on drugs or did cool, inhumane, uh, you know, acts over there and, and all that. And an awful lot of uh, propaganda from various groups um, to paint a picture of uh, what they thought we were, which was not the truth. Did you ever question being over there? Did you ever regret the decision that you made? Well. When I joined, I joined to, to learn a trade. I didn't join to, to go fight a war. Um, but, you know, when you sign your name, you, you give the government a blank check. Um, whether we should have been there or not, I'll let someone else decide that. I think at the time um, and what was going on in the world with the Cold War and China and all the, everything that was going on, um, I guess it was inedible, you know. Um, the problem is that we went over there and we didn't go over there to win the war. And I, you know, I hate to get into this, but you could draw parallels to what's going on today. Same thing. If we're going to go fight a war, Ri Sung Tung, uh, a tra a, he was a Chinese philosopher on, on the art of war. There's certain ways you fight a war, and you have to fight it to win. Otherwise, don't bother. Um, so there was, a, you know, th that was. That was probably the one thing that I regretted, that we didn't do what we should have done. And if you look at the after effects of uh, when we left and the thousands upon thousands of Vietnamese who were slaughtered, the thousands upon thousands that tried to escape in boats, many of them drowned. And then uh, Cambodia and how many were slaughtered in Cambodia. Our presence there had an effect in terms of preserving or trying to preserve some peace or trying to sort some things out. So. You know, now if we hadn't gone in, maybe that wouldn't have happened at all. I don't know. But, uh, no, I don't regret my service. I'm proud of what I did. And, uh, you know, I just think that finally in the last few years there's been a little bit of uh, recognition that most of the guys that went over were just guys that went over. They served their country, thought they were doing the right thing, and uh, got caught up in a war that wasn't or, or became very unpopular. It wasn't in the beginning. You know, it really wasn't in the beginning. Okay, so um, how did you spend your post-war years? You said you went to college to become a teacher? I actually went back to college, and, and um, after a semester of probation, the, you know, they, because my marks were so bad before, I actually gradu graduated with very high honors. Uh, 
Um, and then I, I went into teaching and I taught uh, social studies uh, in high school level. I did that for a few years and uh, like I said, I, I began looking at where I was in, in terms of teaching and, and the, the whole scale of teaching and, and what they're paying. And uh, I was teaching up in Vermont and uh, decided that I had to make more money. So um, I went uh, into business and sales and marketing and ended up, uh, you know, that for the rest of my career, various positions and climbing the ladder of success, whatever. So. So how did you end up here in Maryland from all the way up in the um, back in the Back in the 80s, uh, I was transferred down here as a regional uh, manager, sales manager, for, excuse me, for a company. And uh, that's how I ended up here. So we've been here uh, more or less. The kids have grown up here. Uh, my, my children still live here. They're married and have children. Um, so we see this as home. I did move away in the late 90s. I had a job offer and uh, accepted it, but came back a few years later. Um, so... So Carroll County is something that you call home now? Yeah, Carroll County, sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's see. So uh, what are you doing now here I'm, in Carroll County? I do what I want to do. Do what you want I'm to do. I'm retired. Mm -hmm. um, I, d I do volunteer down at the Senior Center. I'm a wood carver. And so I teach a wood carving class on Mondays down at the Senior Center. And I'm also involved in the Carroll Carvers. We just had our show a couple of weeks ago, maybe you saw it in the paper or whatnot. We tried to get a lot of, a lot of PR, press, uh, something I know a little bit about. So, um, yeah, I do, I do that and keep an eye on the grandkids and uh, fish and, uh, you know, drive my wife around when she wants to go shopping. She drives, but uh, just, just kidding. Um, so, yeah, I enjoy, enjoy my time and uh, do a little writing and, uh, and um, do a little history. I'm I'm always interested in history, so I'm tracing my family histories back and things like that. So, very interesting. Um, I believe you said you also had a poem mm -hmm. as well. Would you like to sure. share that? Sure. Um, I wrote this poem last year for the Veterans Day um, celebration at the Senior Center because I thought it was. Uh, well, I'll give you a little background so to set it. Um, my dad and my father-in-law were in the Marines, both on. World War II in the Pacific, dad was wounded on Iwo Jima. Uh, my father-in-law was, was shot in the right arm. Um, he was a BAR guy, Browning Automatic Weapon was the weapon that the automatics that the Marines carried. He was, he was wounded on Guadalcanal. And I always thought when I came back that if those guys could do what they did and somehow come back, raise families and, and, and prosper, then what I did was a Kate walk, so I should be okay. You know, so. um, but uh, last year I found out, and I've had uh, melanoma for, for a while now. That's a skin cancer. Um, I'll show you the top of my head, but I'm sure the camera doesn't want to see it. So I, got, I got scars where they've taken chunks of, of it out. And then last year I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Well, in researching that, I found out that um, because you're in, you were in Vietnam, it's assumed you were exposed to Agent Orange. Agent Orange was a defoliant that was used um, to clear the jungle in areas so that we could find the enemy. I personally don't have a problem with that. We're fighting a war, you do what you have to do. Um, the problem I had, it took about 15 years for the government to recognize that Agent Orange was a problem that a lot of veterans suffered a long time before they began to get uh, remediation or, or uh, benefits because of the exposure to Agent Orange. But anyways, make a long story short, um, Agent Orange is, 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 has been shown to cause prostate cancer. A lot of Vietnam veterans have a higher than normal average of prostate cancer. So with all that going on in my head and, and with uh, the Vietnam uh, 10th, uh, I think the anniversary is coming up this year of our, um, most of us guys who were there don't call it the end of the war because it wasn't. It was our, our bug out. We decided to leave. You know, we bugged out of there. Um, I wrote this poem. So. And you gotta, you got to remember the times were pretty tough. In 1968, we had the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King. There were riots in the streets. There were civil unrest. All of the, the quote-unquote peace protests were going on. So there was a lot going on. So um, I'll uh, compose myself for a second here. 1968 was a dying time. Young men were fighting in far-off Vietnam. They sent us over there, just boys of 18, we came back old men, though still in our teens. They sent us overseas like our fathers before. 
But unlike our fathers who fought in the, who after the war came home to victory and dancing in the streets, we came home to protests and riots, not peace. Because of the lies they heard on TV, lies from reporters and actress, political wannabes, they cursed us and spat at us, called us killers of babies, when all we were doing was helping people live free. The truth is we served with honor and pride. The truth is we just wanted to come home alive, get married, raise families, live quietly. But that damned war just won't let us be. It's been many years since that terrible time and yet the war still plays havoc with our lives. We have wounds that just won't mend. For us, the war will never end. So welcome home, brothers. We sure have come far. Welcome home, brothers, wherever you are. We hope you found peace through all the years. We hope you found peace to dry up your tears. So that's, that's the poem I wrote. Very good. Thank you. Um, So is there anything else that um, you think left a profound impact on your life besides of obviously going to war? Is there anything that... Uh, I, I think, you know, as you look back on your lives, I'm, I'm, I'll be 69 in a few months. Um, and you begin to look back on it. And like I said, I was an old history teacher for many years and, and still have an interest in history and have read an awful lot about that time and, and other periods in our time. And it enables you to, to, to look at today and say, okay, things are pretty bad today. And we face a lot of dangers. I mean, you know, we turn on the news and everything is instant today. Uh, back then it wasn't quite that fast. Um, that there are parallels. We learn, we learn from history, we don't learn from history. And I can see where some of the things that are going on today, similar to what was happening then. We don't have the protest against the war like we, we, we did back then. Uh, most people see the dangers that we face. But also that we've gone through tough times before. I personally think the 60s, the late 60s, uh, were in many cases worse than, than what we see today. We don't have the, the pro we, there's protests going on, I'm, I'm aware of that. But there's not the, the terrible protests we had, uh, Chicago and, and uh, the, uh, uh, the Democratic campaign in Chicago. Uh, one of the reasons I decided not to become a Democrat was because of what they did during the war. Um, so a lot of, a lot of things have, have, have swept through our, our, our history. And I, I do think that this time, um, you know, probably I, I can draw a comparison. And I guess so that's what had a major impact on me to answer your, story, your question was the 60s, obviously the war shaped, shaped your lives. Um, I came home with a greater appreciation for freedom. I uh, wanted to, to, uh, to make something of, of myself if I could. I was like, successful, I don't know. You know. I raised a couple of kids and they're doing well, so I guess if, if there's success in life, it's, that's a pretty good measurement of success. Uh, and, and also, uh, part of the reason I, I wanted to go, it's been a long time, I haven't talked to really anyone about the war. You probably know more about my experiences and my kids than my wife do. Um, and, and writing the poem was just to, just to set the, what I think is, is the facts that most of us, over 95% I think, got honorable discharges. Many of us went through um, college. On the average Vietnam veteran, higher number of college graduates than the average populace in general. Um, most of us earned higher incomes than the average male populace uh, of the same age. Um, there's a lot of statistics about that, but that doesn't come out. We still have that stereotype that somehow, you know, we're, we're kind of crazed old hippies walking around and, uh, you know, uh, uh, so I wanted, I just kind of like to set that record straight by, um, by the way I, end, I carry myself and, and uh, you know, how I live my life.